This presentation looks at the C preprocessor and its handling of preprocessor macros. We'll look at some advanced macro features, such as macro scope, the use of argument operators, macro expansion, and when and how the preprocessor evaluates macros. The focus will be on common problems people face when using the preprocessor. This information is relevant for any ANSI C compiler. First, a quick revision of basic macro expansion. A preprocessor macro definition in its simplest form is shown at the top of this slide. It replaces every instance of the token name with the replacement text. So in the example immediately below, the variable foobar is assigned the value 20. One of the complications of macro expansion is that after substitution, the replacement text is re-scanned to see if it forms other preprocessor macro identifiers. This expansion process continues until no more macro identifiers are found. In the last example on this slide, the variable setting is assigned the value 100. A common use for a plain macro is to prevent the contents of header files being compiled more than once, as shown in the header file stub in the example box. Only if a particular macro symbol, LCDH in this example, has not already been defined, will the contents of the header file be included. The header file contents are enclosed in the pound if endf and pound endif directives. The macro symbol which controls this inclusion is defined along with the header file contents, thus preventing further inclusion of the same code. The macro LCDH has no replacement text in this example, but is still considered as being defined by the preprocessor. Most compiler-supplied header files use such a mechanism, and this is useful for your header files as well. However, there is a common misconception that this mechanism prevents the header file contents from being compiled more than once, regardless of where the header file was included. The reality is that this only prevents multiple inclusion in the one module, not in other modules. To understand this, you have to consider a macro's scope. And if you're not sure of the difference between a source file and a module, you might want to consult your favourite C text. Just like with C identifiers, preprocessor macros have only a limited scope, which is the part of your code where they are actually defined. A macro scope simply starts where the macro is defined and ends at the end of that module, unless a pound undef directive is encountered first. The preprocessor works on each source file independently, and macros defined in one file are forgotten once it moves to the next. If you were to place variable definitions inside a header file, even those that use this technique, and included it into more than one source file, you may find yourself receiving multiply defined symbol errors from your compiler. Preprocessor macros can also be defined to have one or more arguments. The general form of such a macro is shown here in the top example. Such macros allow you to use the arguments in the replacement text and perform more complex substitution. Whenever the arguments identifier is encountered in the replacement text, it is replaced with the corresponding argument specified when the macro was invoked. The example shows a macro diff, which has two arguments, called A and B, and which evaluates the difference between these, unless that would be negative, in which case it evaluates as negative 1. To prevent any nasty side effects in the expansion, each argument in the replacement text is enclosed in brackets. This is highly recommended at all times. The lower box shows the result after preprocessing. In this case, input is a C variable that will be evaluated in the statement. There are some special operators you can use when a macro has arguments. One is the pound operator, which turns arguments into C strings. In the example in the top box, 
the variable product name will point to a string matrix 2000 after preprocessing. During expansion, double quotes are placed around the pound year tokens. Then these are replaced with the argument value, in this case 2000. The usual C string concatenation joins the string matrix with the expanded year string. The other macro operator is a double pound, which allows you to concatenate any tokens, not just strings. In the example shown in the top box, this operator is used to join the token lat b with the bit argument token. When invoked with the argument 4, it expands to the single token lat b4, which is the register bit variable that corresponds to bit 4 in latch b on some PIC devices. This is very useful, but there is a potential problem if the arguments themselves are other preprocessor macros. Let's say that the programmer has adjusted their code in the previous example to make it a little bit more readable. A new macro has been added that defines motor to be the port pin 4. However, you can see in the lower example box, the expansion of this macro did not take place when it was used, and we are left with a non-existent identifier lat b motor. The problem here is one of ordering. Macro arguments are not expanded prior to being inserted in the replacement text. A preprocessor rule states that tokens in the replacement text of a macro will only be replaced themselves if they are not preceded by a pound or double pound operator or followed by a double pound operator. So in our example, after motor is inserted into the replacement text for B latch, it will not be further expanded since it is next to the double pound operator. Fortunately, we can find a way that allows us to do what we want. So that the expansion of motor is not impeded, we use two macros as shown. One that takes care of the argument substitution and subsequent expansion, and another which takes care of the concatenation. This two-step process means we can concatenate arguments and the arguments can be macros themselves. By now, you might be ready to conquer the programming world and become the macro concatenation king. But before you set out on this endeavour, here's a somewhat contrived example that might look like it will work OK, but will only generate a compiler error for our efforts. The first two lines of code define our concatenating macros we have used in the previous slide. The two-step concatenation method has been used, so this would appear to handle any expansion issues correctly. Reading down, we define IO to be LAT for PIC18 devices, or PORT otherwise, and we define a PIN macro to be 4. The last line is the macro IO read that we are ultimately trying to create. It takes one argument, which can either be latch or port, and this macro will prefix the letters RD to the argument. Above this definition, the two remaining lines of code define macros RD port, which concatenates port and the pin definition, and the macro RD latch, which will either concatenate lat or port to the pin definition based on the selected device. You might want to stop this presentation to ensure you see how everything is defined. So if we were to use this macro in code, as shown in the top box, we might expect it to read from pin 4 of either the latch or port. But instead, if you check the preprocessed output or assembly list file, you'll notice that, as shown in the next code box, our paste macro for some reason did not get expanded and the compiler unsuccessfully looks for a C function with that name. So what went wrong? The problem is in the last three lines of the example code shown on the previous slide. These violate another preprocessor rule, which states that if any nested replacements encounter the name of a macro currently being expanded, it is not considered for further replacement. 
In our case here, the expansion of IO read involves expanding the macro paste that forms RD latch. But the expansion of this macro requires expanding paste for a second time. The second expansion is not performed due to this rule, and so we see it remain unexpanded in the final output. We could work around this issue by creating an identical version of paste, but which has a different name. We could use paste in the IO read definition and the new paste macro in the RD port and RD latch definitions. When the preprocessor expands a macro, the replacement is purely a string of characters. So in this example, max, in the if statements controlling expression, is replaced with the characters open bracket 1000 star 1000 close bracket. The preprocessor does not evaluate this expression, nor is there any concept of types at this point. This is just a string. Later in the compilation process, the compiler will see the expanded expression, and only then will the characters be tokenized, associated with numerical values and operators, and take on C types, as dictated by the usual C language rules. In this example, the compiler will evaluate the controlling expression. The constant 1000 will have an int type. If this code was being compiled using MPLAB XC8, which has an int size of 16 bits, the multiplication will also be performed as a 16-bit operation. The multiplication will overflow and produce the result 16,960, which is less than 32,767. The conditional controlling expression in this instance is false. But there is one instance where the preprocessor has to expand and evaluate the replacement text of a macro, and that is when it is used in the controlling expression of a pound if or pound elif conditional directive. The following example shows the macro max now being used in a pound if directive to determine if the C variable position should be defined in the code. The controlling expression appears identical to that in the previous example where it was used in an if statement. After substitution, the preprocessor has to determine if the expression following the pound if is true or false. The only way it can do this is to evaluate the expression. The preprocessor's evaluation of the constant tokens in this controlling expression is similar to that performed by the compiler, except that signed or unsigned integer types act as if they have the type int max underscore t or u int max underscore t respectively, as defined by the header standard int dot h. For the MPLAB XC8 compiler, this will be a 32-bit representation. This means that the preprocessor multiplication of 1000 by itself will be performed as a 32-bit operation. The result will be 1 million, which is larger than 32,767. The conditional controlling expression in this case is true. The important thing to note from this is that the preprocessor can calculate a different value to that calculated by the compiler for the same expression. MPLAB XC16's and XC32's int size and the size used by the preprocessor for literal constants are different to those used by MPLAB XC8, but these compilers exhibit a similar behaviour. If you need to change the types that are used by the compiler when evaluating a macro, you can use any appropriate feature in the C language, for example by adding a constant type suffix. Use of the capital L suffix in the first example would not affect the size of the values used by the preprocessor if it were to evaluate this expression, but it does change the types used by the compiler. The preprocessor always uses the same size to evaluate expressions, but you can force expressions to be treated as signed or unsigned. The last example shows code using the capital U type suffix, 
which will require the preprocessor to evaluate an unsigned right shift. Who'd have thought macro expansion could get this complicated? Hopefully this presentation has shown you that some caution is needed when using macros, particularly when concatenating macro arguments and when macros are evaluated by the preprocessor. Although the preprocessor is rarely considered when writing code, it conforms to its own set of rules. But it's these rules that make preprocessor macros a consistent tool that can greatly assist you writing flexible code.